Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, uh, our oversight hearing, the reopening of culture in New York, return of indoor programs, open culture, and COVID-19. And for the record, this is our first in-person uh, cultural affairs hearing in over 18 months, so it's great to be back here in person, um, even under uh, different circumstances. I'm uh, joined by Councilmember uh, Dharma Diaz from our committee. Thank you very much, Councilmember. Uh, and we are in session. Um, as everybody knows, um, it's a historic uh, time for us, not only because this is our first in-person in hearing uh, after 18 months, uh, but because the city, and in particular our cultural community, is at a most important time uh, in our history. It's important to remember that the pandemic is not over, and there is a long way to go on the pathway to recovery. Uh, culture never closed. Uh, in fact, it pivoted. Uh, but being able to discuss uh, the recovery, uh, updates, uh, and not just survival is something that we have to mark and uh, celebrate. I also want to applaud our colleagues in, uh, in the sector that we all represent and work for because we know that they have worked uh, incredibly hard uh, to not only make it through the crisis, but to support and lift up each other in earnest and organic ways. Um, just as I've considered it a privilege of a lifetime to fight for uh, culture and the arts and artists um, uh, to keep our city's lifeblood alive um, beyond this pandemic. As chair of the committee for the past uh, 12 years, which is truly one of the great honors of my life, uh, I've tried to create a platform for art and culture, organizations, artists, to highlight uh, their ongoing needs including through related oversight hearings over the past year. Uh, but it's also a privilege to be able to author and champion legislation that makes uh, a tangible difference. We've seen this with the creation of the Open Culture Program. Uh, and last week, I was proud to introduce Open Culture 2.0, uh, or intro number 2398, which the committee is hearing today, and which directly addresses feedback from the art and cultural community about how to improve the open culture program and which will make the program permanent, much like open restaurants and open streets, two incredibly successful programs as well that come out of the response to the pandemic. Uh, it goes without saying that open culture is an opportunity to further democratize our streets, activating streets across the city with arts and culture. Uh, we celebrate indoor opportunities, of course, uh, more so than ever, but the truth is that COVID-19 and variants uh, such as Delta are a reality, and it may still be safer to host performances outdoors, and many still prefer to experience uh, performances outdoors, at least in the immediate future. Uh, for some, it's, uh, it's impossible to return to full indoor performances like we had prior to March of 2020. So the program continuing and being made permanent uh, would be greatly impactful. Uh, and I'm uh, grateful to all those who are here uh, in person to provide testimony on uh, the legislation. And I think we're gonna hear from some folks in the administration probably a little bit about the success of open culture and what we've experienced uh, to date uh, in the law that we passed. Uh, but I know that hundreds of performances have taken place across the city. And uh, I myself have gone to several uh, in my, my neighborhood. And it is, it is so amazing to walk down the street and see uh, dancers dancing, uh, drag queens reading uh, to children, as we had a drag queen story hour uh, on uh, Skillman Avenue in my neighborhood. And, uh, and music happening makes people very happy. Uh, and we could, all, we could all use a little more happy uh, these days. Uh, so to the art and cultural uh, community, uh, both including and beyond those who are here in person today, we thank you again 
uh, for doing the work um, and for creating uh, even more community than existed. We look forward to hearing uh, and learning how as a council we can support you moving forward. I also want to acknowledge uh, some folks, uh, including my legislative director, uh, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, uh, the, pr the committee's principal financial al analyst, Alia Ali, our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, who is to my right, and our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney. Uh, and with that, the committee staff will deliver the oath of the administration. Take it away, Christy. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Christy Dwyer, the legislative policy analyst to the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Uh, I am here to administer the oath to DCLA Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg and to SAPO Director Stefan Grabowskis. Do you both affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Chair Van Bruner. Thank you very much. I want to recognize council member Francisco Moya from Queens, a member of our committee as well. Thank you um, for being here, council member Moya and council member Diaz. Uh, so before we hear from uh, uh, Stefan and uh, uh, Sheila, I just want to say thank you to both of you because uh, um, you were incredibly helpful in um, making open culture a success and working with the council and the committee uh, to design a program that we could stand up in a relatively short period of time and, uh, and uh, bring a lot of artists opportunities to work uh, and get paid for their work. And, uh, and I think it's been a great success. So with that, thank you to both of you and whoever wants to start first, feel free to begin your testimony. Sure, I'll go first. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. It's lovely to see you all in person and not on a little three by three or one by one square on Zoom. So thank you for this opportunity. My name is Sheila Feinberg. I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of New York City, uh, excuse me, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on today's topic, the reopening of culture in New York, the return of indoor programs, open culture, and COVID-19. Cultural activity is at the foundation of our healthy communities and our strong economy. The slow but steady return of culture to our outdoor spaces and increasingly to indoor venues has been a tremendously powerful signal that New Yorkers are ready to reclaim the city we all love. We at the agency have said this many times in the last 18 months, but it bears repeating. New Yorkers in every corner of our city in every walk of life have suffered from COVID-19. The cultural community was especially hard hit. Culture thrives on the exact type of in-person interactions that overnight became a threat to public health. We have conducted two major surveys of DCLA cultural constituents since the start of the pandemic. Together, they paint a devastating portrait of loss in our cultural community. Financial losses are approaching 1 billion while layoffs and furloughs mean that the cultural community is, at least for now, smaller. By Center for an Urban Futures estimate, the city lost roughly half of its arts and culture jobs in the first year of the pandemic. The damage experienced by the most marginalized groups is even worse. Layoffs and furloughs at organizations primarily serving low-income communities of color have persisted at much higher rates. Organizations in low-income zip codes also lost access to their programming spaces at rates more than double those located in wealthier areas. Smaller organizations saw their operating income plummet nearly 40% compared to just over 21% for larger groups. We've been living through a dual pandemic, both a public health crisis and a crisis from decades of systemic racism and disinvestment. We've listened to our constituents, advocated on their behalf, and have made it a priority to drive home that not everyone experienced the same pandemic. We've also set aside funding specifically to address these disproportionate impacts. Last year, we invested in a relief fund for arts educators, a job category that was particularly devastated by layoffs, and increased funding for organizations working in zip codes most affected by COVID-19. 
With a record high budget for the agency of $203 million in the current fiscal year, thanks to the continued partnership between the council, the committee, and the mayor, we will continue to support the cultural community where it's needed most. And I want to thank you again for all of your hard work on that. It's a, something to be very proud of, so thank you. Without losing sight of the profound damage caused to our communities and cultural groups, we've been overjoyed to see the return of creative programming to New York City. It's been important both as a powerful symbol of recovery and a very real return of the immense value that culture brings to our communities. The cultural community's commitment to supporting one another throughout this challenging time has been inspiring and has made reopening efforts safe and successful. The Culture at Three Call, the New York City, the NYC Museum Reopening Task Force, and other collective efforts are, we hope, here to stay. We've been proud of the city's work to support the reopening of culture and revival of New York. Since the start of the pandemic, DCLA has been working closely with cultural groups and our city partners, particularly in the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, NYC and Company, and Department of Small Business Services to understand and support the needs of our constituents. Early on, we partnered with these offices on Virtual NYC to highlight and connect audiences with an amazing variety of digital programming that helped sustain us through those difficult months. Later, our partners in the Mayor's Office created programs like Curtains Up NYC to help groups navigate the federal and state relief funds available to them. And at DCLA, our staff worked tirelessly to process changes to grant applications to make sure that city dollars could continue to flow to the cultural community. But what a year makes. Starting in March of this year, Open Culture NYC, created through legislation sponsored by you, Chair Van Bramer, has been a major success. Over 450 events have been permitted since the program began. Alongside other programs that have, been brought, that have brought city streets to life with dining and performances, Open Culture gave New Yorkers the chance to engage with arts programming in their neighborhoods. It also gave artists and arts groups the opportunity to earn much needed revenue. You'll hear more about this program from my colleagues in the Street Activity Permit Office shortly. Regarding the proposed bill intro 2398, which would make open culture permanent, we share your goals of expanding the role of culture in the life of our city, and we look forward to working through details with you as the legislation progresses. Another major source of support for artists and cultural connection for New Yorkers this year has been the City Artist Corps. Announced by Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Casals in May, the program has provided support to more than 3,000 artists to date. In addition to investing in this hard hit community, City Artist Corps is bringing performances, workshops, and more to every corner of New York City. There are over 100 public programs planned just through the end of September by artists who receive City Artist Corps grants administered with New York Foundation for the Arts and local partners around the city. City Artist Corps has also been partnering with hundreds of artists and DOE students to create murals and performances with NYCHA residents to design and install murals on public housing sites and with artists in hard hit neighborhoods citywide through Carnegie Hall's Beautify NYC program. The full return of live indoor performance will be another important milestone on our city's recovery. Indoor cultural activity resumed cautiously last summer and outdoor performances through Hallmark summer events like the Public Theater's Free Shakespeare in the Park, open culture programs, and the city's homecoming week concerts last month have heralded a new phase of recovery as vaccines give us a major new tool to fight COVID-19. Earlier this year, Mayor de Blasio the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and Actors Fund set up a vaccination site in Times Square for members of the performing arts community. The city clearly recognizes the importance and value of this community. NYC and Company has also launched a historic campaign to attract visitors back safely. And the key to NYC vaccine mandate, for which full enforcement began yesterday, is the next major effort we need to spur our recovery. To clarify, we're not seeking a return to the previous status quo. The pandemic shed a harsh light on too many aspects of our society that are in dire need of major systemic repair. We have lots of work ahead. And while culture never really closed in New York City, a return to the sort of live 
social connections that we've all missed these last 18 months are a welcome sign that our work together is paying off. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I want to recognize Councilmember Gennaro, who is chairing oh. another hearing in the other room. So thank you, Councilmember Gennaro, for uh, joining us uh, on the committee, of course, as he goes to chair this, his committee in the other room. Um, so thank you. And Stefan? <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Van Bramer, members of the committee and the public. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in intro 2398. My name is Stefan Grabowskis. I'm the director of the Street Activity Permit Office, also known as SAPO, and Deputy Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management, CECM. CECM serves as a broad umbrella overseeing and coordinating events and other temporary use of streets, plazas, sidewalks, and parks. We are a one-stop shop for guidelines and permissions from agencies who ensure events are safe and positive for all New Yorkers, from FDNY, FDNY NYPD, DSNY, to DOB and DEP. SAPO grants permits for streets, sidewalks, and plazas, including signature events like the New York City Marathon, to the smallest neighborhood block party. In early 2021, follow, following the passage of Chair Van Bramer's open culture legislation, SAPO implemented the pro this program on New York City streets. Open culture has allowed eligible arts and cultural institutions, along with cultural venues, to apply for expedited and low cost permits to host events on city streets. Our office implemented a simplified application process for these permits to enable, enable wider accessibility. As of September 13th, we have permitted over 459 open culture events. The program has been a success for many organizations. However, it has not been without its challenges. New York City streetscape is shared by a wide variety of users, and this has posed some problems for our applicants in executing their events. Our office works tirelessly to help ap our applicants and ensure that their events go off as seamlessly as possible. Regarding intro 2398, the administration supports this bill and the permanent implementation of the open culture program. We do have some concerns about the best way to increase the number of locations available to open culture permits. We look forward to working with the City Council during the aging process to address these issues and ensure open culture remains a vibrant and effective program for all New Yorkers. In closing, I look forward to working with the Council and our sister agencies in continuing to support cultural organizations in utilizing public space throughout the city. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much uh, to both of you, um, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, the administration for supporting the bill, um, and obviously, there are a few things uh, we want to discuss, uh, and and we'll uh, have that process take place. Um, and I'm sure James Archer will be a part of those discussions, uh, who was uh, a very instrumental in the first round. But um, uh, maybe Stefan, you can tell me what some of the challenges are that we faced, maybe that we didn't anticipate, or what have we learned uh, through these first 459 permanent events that we could do even better with Open Culture 2.0? Sure. Um, you know, I think just I'm going to give a few examples of some of the issues we have, and it's definitely things we can work on trying to find solutions for in the, in the future. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the testimony, there's, you know, a variety of users on the street, not just cars, but also uh, parking garages, auto body shops, and other businesses that have access, need access to the street. Um, so the frequent closure of certain blocks has definitely caused some friction um, between applicants and the owners of those businesses. Um, additionally, you know, we have had, I, we had over 144 locations, however, only about 76 of them were actually applied for, which did lead to a lot of applicants utilizing the same streets over and over again. Um, obviously, some of those streets are probably in culturally significant neighborhoods, and there's no doubt that they would want to use those locations. However, that definitely led to some friction between neighbors, businesses on those blocks, um, who felt that the street was being closed on a very frequent basis. Um, but, you know, generally, we're supportive of expanding the number of locations and, and finding more opportunities for applicants to use, um, but we definitely want to kind of examine what those locations are more closely. Yeah, um, thank you for that information. So if those 76 locations are um, experiencing some tension uh, with some folks thinking it's overutilized, having additional uh, streets to use might actually help alleviate some of that pressure. Yeah, 
having additional streets would could potentially help with that issue. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll look. We look forward to talking about it further with you in your office. But yeah, yeah. Um, but 144 uh, different locations have been utilized under the program. No, sorry. We have we have 144, and I'll send your office this exact number after this. But I think we have 144 locations in total, and only 76 of those were used. Oh, I get it. Okay, got it. Um, and so uh, we could obviously take a look at some of the locations maybe that have not been utilized at all um, and uh, uh, work to find other locations that might be much more relevant for the program. Um, but that's helpful to know. Um, and so those 459 programs have taken place in those 76 yes. locations, essentially. Yep. Got it. And we built into the, the program some limitations on how often uh, a street could be used, right? Um, what is that again and how, and is that helpful? Or are we seeing some of those locations that are used every available date essentially uh, that could be used? Um, so the, the, limita the limitation we had in the guidelines, but it was not in the legislation specifically, the original legislation was up to four events per month, um, which in, in some situations uh, amounted to uh, a location being used once a week. So I think there were some uh, locations where, you know, we've received complaints from residents on those blocks that there's, their street is closed every Saturday. Um, so that basically amounted to that. But we can definitely look towards, you know, coming up with a, a different uh, metric for how frequently somebody can use that street. Got it. Um, and I don't know if you or DCLA has this, because uh, I certainly saw uh, rehearsals going on uh, on uh, 39th Avenue in, in Sunnyside, uh, uh, which was great. Queensboro Dance um, were rehearsing for performances. Do you have a sense of how often folks have used this program for rehearsals um, as opposed to paid performances um, or full-on performances? We did not collect just in our application. We didn't collect specifically if people were, were charging for tickets because it was they were permitted to do regardless. So that wasn't like a condition of their application. Obviously, we worked with you to make a kind of streamlined application. Um, we did do a survey recently, um, which we did find out that 63% of applicants did use this event to generate income directly and or indirectly. That was from, from applicants' own response to our survey. 63% of the 459 events yep. were revenue producing. Based on their own feedback to our survey, so not obviously not everybody responded, but. Um, right. That's, uh, that's, that's 63%. Either, yeah, indirectly or directly, so not necessarily tickets. Right, yeah. right. Um, that's good. Uh, and have we had any response in terms of uh, uh, folks continuing to ask for additional locations or or any issues with um, you know, we, we aimed at geographic diversity, right? Making sure that there were open culture uh, locations in every borough, um, but obviously there still may be some areas that could benefit from having access to the program. Um, we definitely, so DOT managed the locations um, in terms of vetting and, and, and stuff like that. And obviously they're a partner in this, in this program. Um, you know, I think we tried for a, uh, kind of a pilot slate of, of streets, but uh, again, definitely interested in working with, with your office on coming up with a, a long-term permanent solution for where the locations are gonna be. Um, there were some, some requests at times for additional locations. I think when we had to remove locations because of issues like with parking garages or auto body shops, um, in some cases, we were able to replace them. I don't have the total number of locations removed, but I can definitely get you that number from when I speak to DOT after this. Got it. And obviously, we're going to hear from it some was folks. Not, it was not a lot. Uh, it right. was not a big total. Um, terrific. We're going to hear from folks in the, uh, in the sector and in the community, and, and perhaps some folks will have some ideas about how we can uh, enhance the program and uh, make it work even better for artists and, and uh, arts organizations while also making it permanent. Um, and uh, anxious to hear from, from, from those folks. Um, and uh, uh, for DCLA, so the, uh, the, the program uh, that 
that you have going, all these 3,000, the artist core um, folks. Are, are some of those folks being directed to open culture? Are, are many of them, I've had several artists in, in, in my own uh, district who, who were recipient, are recipients of the grant and very excited uh, for them and for what they're working on. Some of them I think are already you know, looking to dovetail into open culture. Yeah, I believe there has been some overlap. I can get you the exact number later. I don't have the exact number, but yes, that is something that has happened. And those folks have to uh, produce those programs pretty quickly, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so hopefully uh, before the weather uh, uh, gets cold. Obviously we are um, in uncharted territory, Stefan, because we just began the program. Uh, we've had good weather. Um, uh, and now we're going into uh, the cold weather, but the program will will continue uh, year round, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. All of our permitting is done on a rolling basis, and I expect open culture will be the same. Um, so, yeah. I mean, generally we see numbers go down uh, in the winter. I mean, we've already started to see some numbers go down um, just in the fall, but it may also be a result of of reopening of some venues, but. Um, you know, we do permit year-round, so it's just a question of snow and weather and whether it holds up. Right. Well, you could have a, a winter festival or a, we do, something I mean, like that. We do, we, do, we do New Year's Eve, as I mentioned in my yeah. testimony. So <laughs> Lots of hot cocoa for everyone um, to get through the freezing weather. Um, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I want to thank, thank you for mentioning for moving. You know, artistic community has suffered a lot. And I know you slept very little throughout this process, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, my question is for DCLA. And in reference to the housing and rent relief program, I'd like to know your involvement in negative or positive on the program as well. Um, are you speaking specifically about our work with NYCHA, or are you just talking about the broader program? The broader program. You know, we haven't had as much to do with that, um, but, you know, we're supportive of it. Okay, thank you. That was all. Uh, thank you very much, um, Councilmember Diaz, um, for your support for our sector and arts and culture in, in the city and obviously your beloved Brooklyn, um, but, uh, but you love artists in all boroughs. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so thank you. I mean, I, I think, uh, as you both know, we worked very hard to uh, stand this up, and uh, and I think it has met with some success, which is very exciting. Uh, every earned income opportunity for artists and arts organizations uh, is just that, a very important earned income opportunity. We want to keep expanding the uh, program and uh, and do it in a way that's equitable, of course, for all. I know that uh, both of your uh, um, organizations, agencies uh, believe that. I know the administration does. So look forward to working with uh, all of you to, uh, to make this happen um, very, very soon. And uh, it's a, a good thing to leave the city of New York um, and, and the cultural sector in particular. So, uh, with that, we'll close this portion of uh, the testimony. Uh, thank uh, both of you. Um, send our regards to Commissioner Casals, uh, who uh, I spoke to and I know um, could not be with us uh, today. And we will hear from, is it, you guys are free to uh, go. Two folks at a time? <laughs> at the table, two at a time? Okay. Um, so why don't we hear from uh, Robin Chattel. Uh, I hope I said that right, from Open Culture Works, and Lucy Sexton, uh, Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. And then we have two other panels to follow um, right after that. Can't hear you, Robin. Is the light on? No, when the light's on, we can hear you better. Hi there. Are you gonna? Are, you, are we being timed? Uh, there is a clock. Um, I think we'd be uh, uh, fairly uh, generous in terms of uh, if you have a little bit more. But uh, we we 
generally ask folks to be in that sure, thank in you. that I'm, zone, I'm, I'm, shall I'm, we say. I'm well, I'm, I said on CB3, I'm well aware of the time. I'm a little over, so I hope you'll bear with me. But thank you so much. You're a little over? Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, but <laughs> um, so you're going to go first, Robin, right? Yes. OK, feel free to start. Um, hi, good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Robin Chattel. I'm a 30-plus years cultural worker and the co-founder of Open Cultural Works. Uh, we formed in January of this year to help artists navigate the open culture permitting process and to mount their work outdoors on city streets. We were inspired to do so after hearing about open culture uh, through the Culture at Three meetings, um, hence our name. Uh, and I, I thank you for that, uh, Councilman Van Bramer. Um, and with the help of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, on March 19th, a year after our city's arts and cultural sector shut down the pandemic, uh, we produced our first open culture events. That weekend, we worked with six art groups in four boroughs on open culture streets, 140th in the Bronx, 103rd in East Harlem, North 6th in Brooklyn, and Hyatt in Staten Island. Since then, and over the last seven months, and through October, we will have supported nearly 80 performing arts groups in open culture streets, as well as in parks and plazas through Green Arts Live and the city's Open Boulevards Performance Series, two programs inspired by open culture. I figure around 400 artists we've worked with, about five per group, we got the chance, who got the chance to share their art and perform and get paid to do so during this pandemic year. We've been in all kinds of neighborhoods, on all kinds of streets, Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, 75th and Broadway, Manhattan, twice, Garfield Place in Brooklyn, Minthorne Street in Staten Island, and Dittmar's Boulevard and 33rd Street in Queens, to name a few. We've employed 50 stagehands, technicians, and sound engineers, collaborated with dozens of bids and open street groups, touched the lives of and brought smiles to the faces of countless New Yorkers. Now picture this, this past weekend, the sun is setting on Dittmar's and 33rd Street, open streets, no traffic. We had our stage on one corner, a bar with outdoor tables and stools was on the other. Next door to us, more outdoor dining. Across on the other corner, Taverna uh, Kaikladis, which is a great Greek seafood restaurant. And down front, about 100 people or so sitting in folding chairs on the bus stop bench and some standing around. Martha Redbone Roots Project was on the stage. We had these blue, pink, and red lights mixing with the white street lights and the yellow-green traffic lights. Mar uh, Martha's rainbow skirt was glistening under these uh, lights, and her bluesy voice was mesmerizing. I felt like I was on some kind of movie set, an MTV studio show with built-in audiences, but I wasn't. I was on a street in Queens on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Everyone around me was there because they wanted to be. People were singing and clapping. Kids were running up and down the street. I befriended Jimmy the Fireman. Jesse Mallon, our headliner, singer, songwriter, composer, and Queens native, said he never would have thought to do this beyond the street. He certainly, and certainly not back in, in Queens, his hometown. Open culture brought this recording artist back home. Now, it hasn't been without its challenges, but I need about 2,000 minutes to talk about that. It took a village to make open culture happen, a city council who listened to its citizens, determined arts advocates who pushed for change, creative artists and cultural workers to bring it to life, community partners to welcome us in. I urge you, city council, to make open culture a permanent city program with designated funding, with staffing, with marketing promotion, oversight, program review, and evaluation processes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I don't know if you knew that I grew up in Astoria, Queens, but I certainly appreciate your uh, leaning into the Astoria story, which is uh, very beautiful. Um, and uh, uh, you brought to life that evening on Dittmar's. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, it's really great to, uh, to actually um, hear a story like that, you know, because you pass a piece of legislation and often you don't really get to see or uh, feel how it impacted people's lives. And uh, in, in you telling that story, you certainly got to see that. Um, so anxious to hear from you after Lucy about uh, some of the challenges you faced and how we can make the program better. But, but uh, as an Astoria kid, thank you for telling that story. Lucy. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and Councilmember Diaz and Christy. Uh, my name is Lucy Sexton. I lead the Cultural Advocacy Coalition, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. 
while it is, I want to just say that it's personally exciting to be here in person with you all, I do want to register the complaint that eliminating the virtual option to meetings means limiting and often excluding artists and cultural workers from outer boroughs and smaller organizations with less capacity to take a day off to come and testify. It was one of the great things about the shutdown was the number of people that could testify. Just wanted to say that. Uh, I've testified at council hearings since the shutdown, reminding you that the most fragile parts of our sector are having the hardest time. And I have repeatedly said, we cannot emerge from this crisis with a more centralized and more white cultural ecosystem. And yet that is what has happened. I am so, uh, attaching the link to a copy of the report by the DCLA done in partnership with Americans for the Arts and Howard Gilman Foundation. It's stark findings. We are a more inequitable cultural ecosystem than ever. As you know, arts and culture were one of the, and by some measures, the hardest hit sector. We were first to shut and will be the last to fully reopen. The key to NYC has delivered another economic setback. And again, those uh, with again, those cultural organizations in the least vaccinated and often least white neighborhoods are the most impacted. Many will not survive. I implore you in thinking of reopening to think about finding federal emergency relief monies to support cultural organizations in the most impacted zip codes. Funds to not only get them through, but to partner with them to increase vaccination outreach and education to the communities that trust them. Now, open culture. <laughs> One of the big innovations of open culture was allowing groups accessing the permits to charge and collect money for the publicly performed work, a first for the city. But as we know, ticket fees often cover only a small portion of the cost of the work, particularly if you keep prices affordable and make the work accessible to all. Additional support in the form of grants and production assistance would be an enormous improvement. While permitting programs, I know, don't come with grants, this program does come with a website as required by its partner legislation. That site could be used to list grants, subsidize production help, and a whole host of information and resources that would make this program more accessible to the artists and groups that most need it. I refer you to the Green Arts Live program as a model. It's a program that provides mini grants and production support for work done in parks and plazas. One final point, a major problem with open culture has been resistance from residents of open culture blocks. In discussing this with the arts community, Sophia Harrison of Arts House Schools in Coney Island suggested that the city send postcards to each resident of, of the affected blocks, similar to the recent cards the city sent about composting. These commu communications should make clear the benefits of the program in bringing traffic to local businesses and safe activities to local families, and perhaps most importantly, make it clear how the residents themselves might use this program to put on performances, dance recitals, fundraisers for the PTA, or a chance for locals to share their own cultural talents. We need clear communication and buy-in from the residents if this program is to succeed. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, for your legendary and groundbreaking support uh, and work for arts and culture in our city. We are in your debt. Thank you very, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, what, oh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing the other room. Um, thank you very much, Lucy, um, for those kind words, but also, as always, for uh, some really constructive suggestions on how we can make this program better and, uh, and more equitable uh, going forward. And I, I definitely think in those areas where um, uh, Stefan's team experiences some resistance uh, from uh, at local residents of those streets, uh, that there, there must be some way of, of notifying um, and somehow including them more. That won't uh, make everyone happy, of course. That won't uh, uh, address all of the issues, but it, it can be helpful. And I, I think bringing folks into the program um, and letting them know what's happening um, in, uh, in their neighborhood. Um, again, most people, I think, as I you know, experienced uh, Carija's programs a couple of times in rehearsals, most people are thrilled and, and walk up not knowing that there was going to be a performance on their street. And, you know, I, I saw uh, lots of ballet uh, and uh, children uh, doing ballet, and, and, uh, and it was wild, uh, wildly successful with hundreds of uh, people uh, just sort of stumbling onto the music. But I also saw a couple of people 
who were less than thrilled with uh, the performance, but uh, um, you know, there, there, there might be more that we can do to try and uh, alleviate some of those tensions. I, I would say that in my neighborhood, the, the local bid uh, get, does open culture on a block every Tuesday. So uh, the bids might be another area where they can be communicating with the local businesses, et cetera. And I want to give a shout out to SAPO. I used the open culture program and boy, were people helpful and communicative and helping me make it happen. So I really appreciated the, the support. That's great. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I know uh, you started off with some, some other comments and thoughts, and I, I just want to share, obviously, having gone through the virtual experience, um, we did see increased participation, obviously, in, in the virtual hearings, uh, which I, I loved. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, the council is, I think, thinking about how we do this work, right, uh, going forward. And so we have today an in-person hearing uh, with uh, limited uh, ability for folks to, to testify. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's an ongoing uh, discussion of how do we, how do we uh, merge the two if we do and, and how does that happen. Um, what's that? I said hybrid. Yeah, yes, yes. Hybrid, um, for sure. So um, I want to just uh, go back to Robin, um, because your testimony, you talked about just in the, in the programs that you've worked on, uh, 400 artists um, and, and you know, 50 stage hands, um, you know, uh, getting paid for their work. Um, which is just a, a portion of the programs that have taken place um, at a time when folks are desperate, uh, in many cases, uh, to work. Um, that demonstrates uh, the success of this program as a job creation um, a tool. But I know you had some thoughts on some things that, uh, some challenges that you faced, and I'm interested to hear what those are and if you have any suggestions on how we could improve the program in Open Culture 2.0. Uh, zero to uh, to help you further. Sure. Yes, I I, I do. I mean, I, I you know there there's sort of th sort of three areas I suppose. One would be the funding funding and financial support. Obviously, you know the open culture program uh, was announced and it was it was sort of like here's your here's your you know four walls that they call it in the theater. Your open space. Have have a show. Good luck. But the artists need support, and that support costs money. And without that funding of some sort, you know, it, they they couldn't do they, they couldn't do what they needed to do. And from the production standpoint, the part that we did production for our company, we really did the best we could to offer our services as free as possible as people also in the arts who needed to to, to be able to work. So that was a big part of it. I also um, think institutional support. I've talked about institutional support or agency support. That this is not this, this to me was always a program and not just a a, 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 a permit, right? At, and that to be a program, it needs staffing, it needs to be marketed, it needs to be promoted, the public needs to be educated about it, and it needs, uh, you know, that institutional support. Everything from the police departments being involved in helping move parked cars to, uh, you know, NYC and Go, and Go, which is the city's marketing arm, helping to create something, or the the, the office of uh, the MoM office, you know, as they do a lot of their big announcements, like the one book or one film. I think this is a program that could really take off and do that for the city of New York. Um, you know, yes, I, I think I would also then begin with the choice of streets and to ha how those streets are chosen and to, and, and to work with the arts community, to work with local community groups and bids to choose the streets uh, uh, intentionally. And intentionally in that, you know, there are partners in neighborhoods that would be working, we, artists and groups would be working with so that there are those resources, bathrooms, electricity, uh, you know, stuff like that. and that. That's a way to engage, I think, neighborhood residents when there's a community organization involved. Um, and so I think that's something that would be helpful to really be intentional about the street choices. And often, obviously, some of these streets are very narrow and small. And so just from that sort of built environment standpoint of trying to fit in 15, you know, the, the fire lanes of 15 feet, but you need to have a small stage or you want to perform or you have speakers, you know, how, how do you fit all that in? Um, so I think intentional. Uh, street choices, but I, I again really 
you know, and I, I don't know how this can happen, but some kind of funding, really turn this into a program, really get the support of, the, of all the city agencies behind this to, to, to announce this. And I could, I could see this being a, you know, summer festival, the open culture, you know, summer festival, all five boroughs. I could see something like that happening. It would take financial support and marketing support. And I think that, yeah. that's it. And, you know, just this, and, and just, you know, again, I think it's, or as Lucy's point about, uh, and, and Stefan's point about unhappy residents, I mean, I think it's not just marketing promotion, but it's really educating the public about what this program is and w who it's serving and why it, it exists. Those are all uh, very good points. And uh, uh, I know funding is always uh, needed and requested and always the most challenging thing to come by. But um, I, I, I definitely agree agree with you about this being a program, and I think one of the ways that we make sure it actually becomes and there was a fully functioning program is that it be permanent. Uh, and, and I think including NYC and company and uh, getting support from, from them uh, is, is something that we absolutely must achieve. Right. And, and, and earlier, I think you said something about this being an, an economic driver, as we know the arts are. And I mean, in, in all, you know, we've been to, I've been to so many neighborhoods, and you know, it, it brought people out. The restaurants were busy, bars were busy, the, the cafes, you know, we, we spent money, the artists spent money, we spent money. So it's really, you know, on a local level, really it helps the local economy as well. So I think that's an important factor. Um, one last thing I'd like to mention, and I mentioned this on some phone calls I've had with Jack about, you know, uh, if, if this is going to be a permanent program, something like, you know, uh, uh, a, a kit that an artist can use that's in a, that's in a container on that street and anyone can use, there's a combination, chairs, you know, whatever might be needed for your, sh for your show, some kind of like technical support materials would be really helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Lucy, any uh, more uh, suggestions or ideas, um, things you've heard from the, the sector in terms of what we could do better here? Um, the, Robin covered a lot. I think that the, 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 the website is where I'm going back to in terms of communication um, so that we can also let people know that these are happening. Uh, right now, it does a good job of listing all of the things, but it just lists what's on the permit application, so it says like, you know, that, you know, Dance Theater of Harlem, you know, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. and where it is. But, you know, if, if, if in the permit application you asked everybody to put in their website or a link to a thing, then you could, people would say, okay, I'll link on that website and find, oh, they're doing this and it's at 7 p.m., not at 8 a.m. or whatever. So um, just in terms of improving the way we communicate about all these things that are happening. Uh, either of you can answer this question. Uh, have you, what, what has been your experience with uh, local community boards, um, the local precincts, you know, some of the folks who uh, you, you might need help from and or uh, could be helpful in promoting the event, but uh, in some cases, obviously, you might also face resistance from a, a, a local civic or community board. What, have there, has there been a lot of, uh, interaction between those organizations and entities or what have been that those experiences like? The, uh, at the neighborhood where I'm in, which is Soho and where I did my event, you know, it's mostly businesses. So they were happy um, and they, the bid was involved. So that was, that was seamless. We had wanted to do it on 104th, um, East 104th, which is another of the open culture blocks. And one thing that uh, we were hiring open culture works and one thing they provided was like, okay, these are the guys that hang out in front of this store, they're really helpful, go talk to them, you know, invite the local school, you know, so like in that website where you say like, okay, what, who's, what, I'm gonna go down 104th Street. Okay, here's all the community organizations on 104th Street that you might wanna reach out to to say, we're doing this. So it's that deep local on the ground, you know, who's hanging out where and who's gonna help you do this in a way that will make the community enjoy it and not be resistant to it. So I think it's definitely possible, but I think it is about um, using our communication tools and some of the local knowledge, et cetera. Yeah, and, and being, being on the ground, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the community affairs officers are always very helpful, you know, uh, at the precincts, but it, it, it more than, more, some more than others, really depending on the relationship they have with the bit local bids. You know, uh, we were on the Upper West Side um, and uh, the Columbus Avenue bid there, the, the Northern bid, 
had a great relationship with the community affairs officer, so we were able to get the four cars parked where our stage was supposed to go or where the performance was supposed to perform. But that didn't, you know, it didn't happen everywhere. And um, I, in fact, I didn't even get a sound permit on Saturday because they were too busy. But um, I, I, you know, I, I think I think with, there seemed to be like a sort of lack of knowledge really about what we were doing in a way, you know. And um, I, I think that would be more helpful. Um, I, I, something what Lucy was just talking about almost to me sounds like the back end a little bit. Like there's the marketing, once these events are together, there's the marketing promotion and communicating to the general public that this is happening. But on, on, the, on the other side, you know, to be able to have a team that can actually pull all those resources together to know if you're having a street. You know, what, what is, uh, you know, Garfield Place in Brooklyn, it was like a completely residential block. Um, but what's near there and who's near there? You know, it takes a team of people to do their research and, and to find the resource and to know who's there and to knock on those doors. So how do you, how do you sort of build that in to this? That's, that would be a question. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, we, we, we crossed our fingers whenever we went to a street to hope that the cars weren't parked where we were supposed to be setting up. And that, that's a big, that was a, the biggest issue, I guess. Uh, any, any, uh sound or amplification issues um how did that did that always work out yeah i we i, I haven't I, I mean i haven't gotten it did always work out you know we had to bring power that's the other thing you know um when we did the events in the on uh, in the 104th street in the bronx it was the bet one of the best blocks we've been on because it was uh two arts uh, organizations were on the block um the bronx arts arts and culture center and ID Studio Theater. So we were able to use their power. We didn't have to worry about generators. You could plug into their power. We could go in there and do our setup. So that was an ideal block, to be on a block where you have a cultural partner who can help you provide that stuff. But mostly it's generators. And you know, generators are, are run with gasoline, and that's the cheapest way to go. And the most expensive way, the green generators are very expensive. So, so that's, you know, we had to bring, we brought power wherever we went, basically in order to amplify. But as far as um, any feedback or people being upset about the sound, I, I hadn't come across that just as a... That's great. Um, uh, that's great. This is very helpful. Thank you for um, everything you're doing, uh, both of you, to make sure the program is, um, a real program is successful and uh, ultimately permanent and of course, um, funded, uh, so uh, really, really appreciate everything you do. And, and Lucy, I think you were on more than just a few of our virtual hearings. I feel like you were on all of our virtual hearings um, <laughs> over the year and a half that we went virtual. Um, and, and thank you um, for, for that and for your advocacy on behalf of the community. So um, unless Councilmember Diaz has any uh, questions for this panel. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming to join us in person today and for everything uh, that you do for our sector. Uh, and with that, um, again, we have two more uh, panels of two. Um, Emily Mathis Corona from Ballet Hispanico. And uh, is it Fran Garber Cohen? And Fran Garber Cohen. All right, one more panel after that. Feel free to start. Uh, is it on? As yes. long as the light is red, it's on. Oop. There you go. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Emily Mathis Corona, Assistant Director of Institutional Relations at Ballet Hispanico. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ben Bramer uh, and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm here to advocate for the permanency of the Open Culture Program and for continued city funding to support the return of indoor programming in 2022. As Ballet Hispanico joins its fellow arts leaders in recovery and in the immense challenge of reopening, it looks to city leaders for guidance and support. The sustainability of the successful open culture program is imperative to this recovery. The economic impact of a thriving arts ecology to New York City cannot be overstated. Nonprofit cultural groups generate over 8 billion annually in citywide economic impact and employ more than 120,000. 
The city's booming tourism industry, neighborhood vitality, and commercial vibrancy are dependent on the contributions of the cultural sector. And in an era of stark division, the voices of BIPOC-led cultural organizations like Ballet Hispanico, founded on the principles of bringing people together through art, are more important than ever. From its inception, Ballet Hispanico has been centered in its mission to increase access to dance through community outreach, engagement, and education. BH community programs reach thousands of New Yorkers of every walk of life, uplifting young people of Hispanic heritage and inspiring all to learn about Latinx culture through the lens of dance. The pillars of the open culture program, open space, affordability and accessibility, sustainability, and solidarity between cultural organizations will ensure critical Ballet Hispanico programs and others like it can continue to thrive in a post-pandemic economy. Through efforts like the Open Culture Program, the city has indicated that it deeply values a thriving arts ecosystem. More than ever, organizations like Ballet Hispanico will need robust public support in order to continue championing and amplifying underrepresented voices. The proposed permanency of the Open Culture Program ensures our survival as we enter this next phase of reopening. Ballet Hispanico was founded upon and has always believed in the importance of reaching and serving our community through dance. We thank the city of New York for making that possible. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Fran Garber Cohen, president of Regina Opera. For 51 years, Regina Opera, located in Sunset Park, has offered fully staged operas with full orchestra and English supertitles, as well as many ticketed and free operatic and co classical concerts. We provide affordable entertainment in accessible venues for audience members who may not otherwise attend live performances. The performances bring happiness and empathy to our audiences and bring people together, especially senior citizens who make up about 65% of our audience. We perform three full operas each season, each featuring four ticketed and one totally free performance, complete with supertitles. The need for this cultural enrichment is reflected in the fact that over 4,000 people usually attend our performances each season. Due to COVID, we lost ticket income from 16 months of live performances. Moreover, we lost our audience. People had to remain in their homes. They lost the connections that they made when they attended live musical performances. People who live in Sunset Park and other low-income sections of Brooklyn who were lucky enough to have essential jobs or had work that they could do remotely were still not able to attend the musical performances they loved. Once New York City opened a little in March 2021 and live performances were permitted in outdoor locations, Regina Opera took advantage of the open streets, open boulevards, open culture programs. Since March 2021, our company reached out to people who needed music to bring a little cheer to their lives. Regina Opera pre presented seven free outdoor concerts on 59th Street, 3rd Avenue, 5th Avenue, Berry Street in Brooklyn. We even sang opera selections in a school playground and a public park. Better than nothing. We were so grateful for our performances and so were the people in the audience. We got extra names for our ticketed performances that we will be scheduling in fall 2021. The outdoor performances brought increased foot traffic to local restaurants in shops, assisting them financially in this difficult time. We request that New York City continue to permit the open streets, open cultures to be added to the New York City Charter and be open to additionally fiscally sponsored arts organizations and individual artists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, love to hear that uh, you've added to your uh, mailing list and, uh, and the performances as part of Open Culture have uh, made some folks aware of the organization that maybe who weren't aware before because that was one of the things that we talked about um, as we were developing the legislation and then implementing it um, with uh, the teams, uh, we very, very specifically wanted that to happen and that to be an outcome of, of the program and thought it, it would, and I'm, I'm sure it's uh, the case for, for so many. Um, and I'm glad you've, you've been able to do those seven. 
outdoor concerts. Um, and those were you did those were free performances. Yes. Uh, right. Yes. And we gave seven totally free 90-minute operatic uh -huh. performances using uh, featuring our opera stars from Regina Opera. Wow, that's a wonderful uh, gift to the people of. Uh, uh, were they all in Brooklyn? Yes, right? All in Brooklyn? Yes. Yes, that's yes. great. In the uh, Sunset Park and Bay Ridge sections of Brooklyn, we limited ourselves mostly to those sections because the city councilmen, uh, Mr. Brannan and uh, Mr. Menchaca, supported us and included in their funding for us was performances that were free and accessible to the public, and that's what we did. That's great. Uh, uh, great to hear uh, that my colleagues are, are so supportive uh, as well. Um, Council members uh, Menchaca and Brennan. Um, and uh, uh, Ballet Hispanico, of course, we, we know and love. Um, <laughs> and uh, you, you do amazing work. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you have a, 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 a bit more structure and, and, and resources than some. And are you able to um, help others maybe who are, um, you know, attempting to do something like this uh, and partner with them or, or provide assistance? Are you doing any of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest lessons this year, um, you know, we learned this with our Band Together Dance Festival at Lincoln Center in, in August, uh, is that we, we stand in solidarity with our fellow arts leaders, with uh, other arts nonprofits, no matter what their size across the city. Um, moving forward, you know, of course, our block party will be including other Latinx dance organizations in this. And it's something that you know, we want to continue making a center point of our, of our work uh, and our mission. Um, so programs like this are absolutely instrumental in, in helping make that happen, in making art more accessible for everyone. I would love to see one of your performances outdoor, um, and I would love to hear opera. I love opera, and uh, uh, I've certainly seen several dance programs in, uh, in Queens as part of Open Culture, and as I mentioned, uh, we also had a Drag Queen Story Hour as part of Open Culture, which was great uh, on one of our streets, but I um, would love to hear opera coming from a local neighborhood street. I think that would be... Uh, tremendous. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll have one. Um, but uh, thank you both for uh, being here. Any other suggestions on how we can do this better? Uh, yes, um, I must admit that we got a lot of pushback from the place, the um, stores that we were placed. Most of the places that we performed, we were placed there by the local bids. Uh, or uh, the um, Third Avenue Merchants Association in Bay Ridge. Uh, when I, I met with the owners and managers of the stores that we were placed in front of, and don they donated their electricity. But I met with, I went there in person to check out the location and to meet with the managers or owners. I spoke to people on the phone. We got a lot of pushback. Oh, you're blocking the street. Uh, you're taking away our business. They did not see uh, any benefit for their stores at all. I, I, it's a mystery to me. They were getting all kinds of new people into the area, but I guess they didn't see extra cash register activity right away. So the, the, the publicity that they received didn't seem to make any difference to the management of the stores. Uh, and some of the places that we were put na near, uh, they seemed to say, oh, we didn't even know you were coming. We got some phone calls. We told them we never heard of you. So uh, we were a little surprised at that. We had over 300 people. We had over 300 people. We did a marine park through se uh, State Senator Gunardis's office. We had over 300 people. That's just my count. And for all the other locations, we had uh, between one and, and 200 people who came. They brought their folding chairs because that's the publicity that Regina Opera did through our mailing lists 
email and paper mailing. We said, bring your chairs or bring a blanket. And we had people sitting on the ground because they just passed by and said, look, free opera. We did distribute paper programs so people knew exactly who we were and what we were performing. In Great. all, uh, and we have more coming up. We right. have another Fifth Avenue in Bay Ridge coming up on September 20, uh, 24. Right. Well, another freebie. Sounds, uh, you, the issues that I think you experienced are, are not unlike some of the others who've experienced similar issues. I think the communication and uh, promotion and amplification uh, of, of these events is part of that, if we're able to do that perhaps better and, and partner with folks like NYC and company, then maybe some folks would be more aware that, that this was coming and happening. But uh, uh, I also suspect human nature being what it is, there'll always be some folks who are um, less than thrilled uh, or, or surprised uh, by an event, but hopefully once they start to hear uh, the music or the dancing, they see the dancing or they hear the opera, they're um, their hearts and minds are changed and uh, into supporters of the program. So uh, uh, thank you both uh, for being here, for the work that you do uh, on behalf of all New Yorkers. Appreciate you being here today in person um, to uh, be a part of this hearing. Uh, the opportunity. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. And our last panel um, is Juliana Cope and Sarah Cecilia Bukowski. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having all of us. I'm Juliana Cope. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of, for Development and External Affairs at Mind Builders Creative Arts Center in the Northeast Bronx. And um, really happy to be here in your presence. And Thank you. And grateful for the incredible support of DCLA and the City Council um, and the Mayor's Office for our programs. Mind Builders. Uh, has been around for 43 years. We are a multi-service agency, but primarily uh, offering music and dance programs, as well as a full-day pre-K program, theater, visual arts, anime, um, and multiple other art forms to ages three to, well, we haven't had 103, but I would love to see that happen. Uh, serving over 700 students a week in good times. And in spring of 2020, we had some of the highest COVID rates in, in the entire city. And subsequently uh, this year have been in a assembly district with some of the lowest vaccination rates. Uh, our audience is pre predominantly uh, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Latinx uh, with, um, a large uh, and growing uh, African, Amer uh, African and Middle Eastern community. And, um, and our staff and board uh, and founder, founder are, are very much reflective of this. Um, so I'm, I'm here fully, we are fully in support of the Open Culture Program. Uh, we were beneficiaries of a permit and we are thrilled this week we're going to be having and our open house and annual open house street festival um, this coming weekend. Um, and it was a relief valve to just know that we, if needed, could do uh, programming on our streets, uh, on our, the street outside our building on Olinville Avenue uh, if needed. But we were actually able to uh, offer hybrid programs throughout this, this past summer and uh, and we're hoping to uh, fully reopen this fall, but we are gonna continue offering um, both virtual and in-person options. Um, our programs have served 
community members from all five boroughs of New York City historically, um, but we did, we have found that, of course, the impacts of COVID uh, continue to roll in and um, our, I would say our, our income in, in this past year was heavily hit. Most of our programs are, or actually all of our programs are subsidized. Many of them are free, but our, um, our income from tuition uh, is about a, a fourth of what it traditionally was and our student body um, also was reduced. We, we had over 45% of our families uh, have at least one essential worker in, in their households. And, um, and we, are, we are currently finding that vaccine hesitancy is going to really impact um, particularly our young people who are 12 and up who may not have the choice of whether they, um, whether they get vaccinated or not. So I just wanted to share with you, sorry, I'm over time, but I just wanna share with you, for example, this coming weekend we have our incredible um, music, um, excuse me, and dance ensemble uh, students, a number of whom are going to be able to perform outside, and then they are not going to continue in the program. And Take your time. Um, it's great to see you. You you're a recipient of Coalition of Theaters of Color. Yes. Support. Yes. Incredible. Which is great. You know, we increased that initiative by two million dollars this year. So yes. hopefully, um, yeah. uh, you'll be seeing uh, an increase uh, in uh, in CTC support and uh, uh, and uh, perhaps some of the other. Um, uh, ways in which you you draw down funding from DCLA yes. and uh, and the city of New York, which is great to see. Um, and uh, sounds like the open the open house or the open streets uh, is happening. It it is happening. We are we are doing uh, our open house uh, inside and outside. We are thrilled to be able to do that. Um, I did also want to mention that we, you know, thanks to your advocacy and so many other uh, city officials, we were also, we were able to retain our entire staff throughout mm. the last year and a half. And uh, it just simply would not have happened um, without your support. That's just, great to hear. Um, lastly, that is I just rare. want to say for institution like ours, it's where it's because we have a pre-K program and, but we also fall under the key to the city mandates. We are, it's just continued complexity for us to try to, one, understand where we fall, how we implement those um, protocols. And then we are also finding that we are, um, the weight is, the burden is very much on us as an institution and, and some of the anger <laughs> about the mandates and the impact on, on the, the young people. So yeah. um, the more, and we're, we're doing all we can, we're going to have a vaccination ban, we're doing outreach, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as, as you continue to do your work, we hope. Well, um, um, this will continue. Uh, I wish it weren't <laughs> going to continue to be complicated, as I'm sure we all do. Um, hopefully it gets less complicated. Um, but uh, certainly we're grateful for all the work that you do and and Mind Builders does, um, you know, for the communities that you work with and serve. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, that. And um, Dance NYC, would you like to, uh, Sarah, begin uh, your testimony? Yep. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Cecilia Bukowski. I am the Research and Advocacy Assistant at Dance NYC. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to speak in support of the Open Culture Program, and thank you for your support as well. Um, the enduring cost of this pandemic is significant both for independent arts workers and for arts organizations and groups, and it's disproportionately impacting communities of color as well as immigrant and disabled artist communities. 
Open culture has shown its potential to help support arts and cultural workers as we continue to adapt to the realities of the pandemic. And moving forward with this as a permanent city program is a substantial investment in the resilience and long-term recovery of the arts and culture sector. With gratitude, we believe there are some comprehensive improvements to be made to the program in order for it to be financially, logistically, and administratively beneficial and accessible to arts workers, particularly those operating with small budgets. First, to make Open Culture a permanent city program with designated funding, oversight, and program review and evaluation processes, including site evaluations with specific considerations for structural elements, use of amplified sound, logistical limitations, and seasonal variations, which will more effectively meet the needs of arts workers in the selection of sites and in the implementation of appropriate and necessary accessibility and health and safety measures. Second, the current monthly event limit for open culture participants stands at four days per month. We recommend designating separate monthly event limits for eligible participant groups, knowing that the eligibility is expanding in this proposed bill, um, and that no limitations be placed on sponsor organizations. Designating these separate limits for each qualifying group would allow for more equitable opportunities for program participation, particularly for small groups and independent uh, arts workers who are seeking sponsorship. Third and final, to provide specific guidelines and templates for entities operating open culture events to comply at minimum with ADA regulations and local, state, and federal mandates regarding COVID-19. This would greatly facilitate compliance with the ever-changing COVID-19 safety regulations and allow equitable access to and standardized implementation of open culture events. So taken together, these measures could stand to make open culture more accessible, equitable, and sustainable for arts workers and for the communities they serve. Thanks for your consideration, and we commend your ongoing efforts to support arts and culture through this program. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Very nice to uh, have you here in person uh, testifying, um, and uh, obviously, uh, we're big fans of Dance NYC and uh, Alejandra and um, 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 even some of uh, her predecessors who we've worked with very closely um, over the years. And uh, not surprising, you come with um, good suggestions and solid uh, recommendations for how to make the, the program better. And I just want to recognize uh, Stefan has stayed here uh, throughout the entire hearing to, to listen uh, to all of uh, the suggestions from uh, the community uh, because um, it is with Stefan on behalf of the administration that we'll be working uh, to, uh, to pass this legislation among other folks and entities. Um, so really, really helpful. Do we have any sense of how many or what percentage of the programs are dance uh, through open culture? And, and I don't know if you would have that information, obviously. I but, don't uh, have data on that. But I don't know. I would Stefan be is shaking his head no. But it'd be interesting to, uh, uh, to get that um, information um, just because most of the ones that I've seen are dance, and it does seem ready-made for dance performances. Um, but, uh, but hope that we're getting a wide range. Um, and Mind Builders has, has uh, used the open culture program or, or uh, not specifically, but you, you do outdoor programming. We, we will in the future. We, we, we have a permit for our street, right. but we, we ended up not using it up until, okay. I think this, our, our festival permit is through the, um, it's SAP. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stefan is uh, aware of it behind you yes, there, yes. gave a thun, thumbs up. So, uh, and that's at your Olinville Avenue uh, location. Off Gun, Gun Hill Road. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, uh, thank you. Well, um, we very much appreciate you being here. And uh, um, I was gonna say waiting all this while, but uh, uh, given the um, uh, relatively limited um, uh, ways in which we can take testimony today, um, it was uh, 
uh, hopefully not that long of a wait. But we're grateful uh, for the work that both of you do for the organizations um, uh, that you work for and, of course, um, all the folks who benefit from the advocacy uh, that you do. So um, thank you very much. All of the suggestions uh, we are taking, we have, and will be helpful to us in uh, passing this piece of legislation, hopefully very soon, uh, and uh, making this program better and more permanent. And uh, artists for, for years and years and years will benefit from the work that we do now and also the fact that uh, you're here testifying. So thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you for your service. And with that, I think we are adjourned. Thank you.